as a way of introduction, look at what what it was we were looking for when we um, we allocated grants to people. Um, firstly, I think it was in 2008 that um, UWC really started to relook teaching and learning, and um, to see the benefits of. Uh, looking at the scholarship of teaching and learning. And um, all this is really to, to develop reflexive and socially responsive graduates. And um, we do acknowledge that as, as an institution, we had a, an interesting history in terms of teaching and learning, and we had a very, very good academic development center, which was um, challenging in the early days conventional pedagogic discourses and we really wanted to um, to gain by uh, re-looking that and reviving it. Um, in 2008 we also had two um, Australian academics who came to visit the institution, Roger and Karen Moni, um, who were very passionate about the scholarship of teaching and learning and they represented this as a triangle which um, has at the bottom the reflective practitioner. So that is uh, the beginnings of the scholarship of teaching and learning. And then um, the scholarly teacher, where one is bringing theory and knowledge into it. And then um, right at the apex, the scholarship of teaching and learning, which is also um, disseminating the knowledge and bringing it into the public domain. So this is sort of, you know, <coughs> What we're doing today is working towards that apex because we, we're starting to share our findi findings with each other. Um, the, the Directorate of um, Teaching and Learning um, has, um, since its inception, really um, emphasize self-reflexive research into teaching and learning practices as well as innovations in teaching and learning. And we invited uh, proposals which were looking at these new directions. And we also encouraged people to work cross disciplines and cross faculties, but we have also supported disciplinary based proposals. Um, so the proposals were reviewed by the Senate Teaching and Learning Committee, a subcommittee of that, and um, priority was really given to proposals which related to the strategic plan for teaching and learning, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with now. Um, and the idea is to disseminate the knowledge in public fora and to get some academic publications out of um, the the um, the grants. So these were the sorts of areas that we we really prioritised in terms of um, uh, asking for for um, the grants. We were interested of, in epistemological access, how students are inducted into academic discourses. Um, how are we doing in terms of aligning and developing graduate attributes? How are we going to promote the status of teaching and learning, which I think still needs a lot of work in this institution? Um, what sort of intellectual, physical and virtual spaces would enable effective teaching and learning? Management of large classes, small group interaction, innovative peer review processes, outcomes-based education in, in the higher education sector, innovative assessment practices, flexible learning strategies, inquiry-based and research-driven curriculum, theoretical underpinnings of pedagogic practice, and um, innovative teaching and learning practices using emerging technologies, supportive environments for student success, accessing university education and then once people have accessed it, how do we retain them? Um, another thing that we've concentrated quite a great deal on is professional development in teaching and learning. We've also looked at authentic learning and what that means and monitoring and evaluating the teaching and learning 
um, process at UWC. So these are the sorts of things that we ask people um, to send in proposals for, and that's what we're going to be hearing about today. So we're looking forward to hearing what people have done with their grants. Um, we've got, as I said, quite a full program. We're having a plenary session in the morning, and in the afternoon we will have two um, sessions, one in this room and one next door. On your program, uh, um, the, the venue is incorrect. It says the, li the audit Life Sciences Auditorium. So it, it, we will be using these venues. We are also very fortunate to have with us um, Professor Denise Wood, who's sitting here in the middle, um, who's becoming a frequent visitor to UWC. We're very lucky to um, have her as an adjunct professor. Um, she is an associate head of School of, school of, in, of Teaching and Learning um, in the School of Communication, International Studies and Languages at the University of South Australia in Adelaide. Um, and her research <coughs> focuses on the use of accessible information and communication technologies to increase social participation as well as the pedagogical benefits of social media and teaching and learning. She's been a project leader on three national teaching and learning funded projects, <laughs> probably four now, because she's just received another one. And fortunately, we also part of that one, UWC, and several state government and industry funded projects. She's also an investigator and project leader with the Young and Well Cooperative Research in Centre in Australia. And she's undertaking collaborative research in South Africa with the Gauteng and Limpopo provincial governments involving an investigation of the use of accessible ICTs to en enhance student learning and increase student retention in rural and semi-rural special needs schools. Um, and she's been working for three years on that project. I don't know if you're going to mention it, Denise, but um, those of you who are interested could ask her in, a, in the tea break, perhaps. She's an associate editor of Higher Education and Research Development Journal and a peer reviewer of several high-ranked journal publications. She's also a member of the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, Standing Advisory Committee on Disability Issues and the Australian Disability Professionals Association, as well as a number of other advisory committees. Um, her work in innovative teaching and learning and accessibility solutions for learners with special needs has been recognised in Australia by several awards, including the Australian Learning and Teaching Council Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning. A South is it a South African great? South Australian. A South Australian <laughs> great award. Several university teaching and equity awards and the inaugural 2010 Telstra TJA Christopher Newell Award for Telecommunications and Disability. So um, we're very honored to have you coming to do the, the keynote for this colloquium and very interested to hear what you have to say. Thanks very much, Denise. Um, so, um, hello everyone and welcome to the colloquium. Um, I'm in my comfort zone being amongst uh, innovative educators uh, in the space of teaching and learning. It is my passion uh, and, and there are very many familiar faces so it's lovely to see you all again and some of you indeed were at my workshop yesterday where we talked about strategies for um, uh, preparing grant submissions for external teaching and learning funding. Um, now, I, as Viv mentioned, I, um, I have led four national teaching and learning uh, funded grants in Australia. We're very fortunate in Australia to have category one, which is prestigious level of ranking of grants uh, that include teaching and learning. Um, and uh, the most recent of those that's just been awarded, um, which, ben, uh, which Viv mentioned, is, um, does involve UWC, and I'll draw on, I'll sort of finish up and talking to 
because uh, in some ways that grant brings together some of the other projects that I've been working on in a kind of cohesive way, I hope. Um, but as, as the title suggests, I have an interest in obviously technology enhanced learning, um, number one, but I am particularly interested in the ways in which in an era where we're increasingly embracing with um, a diverse student population, that how we can engage with the diversity of our students in a way that ma maximizes the affordances of these technologies um, uh, and, and brings out the best, I guess, of our individual students through personalized learning approaches. Okay, um, so, sorry, the resolution's a little bit small on this screen up there. So one of the things that we do know about our, our kind of um, new generation of students coming into universities is that they have, many of them, but not all of them, have been introduced to digital technology in some way, either through the mobile phone or if they're lucky enough to have access to a computer. And there are certain characteristics that a lot of the researchers talked about, their interest in multitasking, immediacy, multimodal learning. And the thing that really appeals to me is this kind of last point about, and, and which relates to the previous point of a need to be socially connected and interested in things that matter. And I think that's one of the things that sort of captures my interest in how to engage my, my learners, my students, because by and large, I find most of our young people really do want to work on projects that are going to make a difference. Many of them, particularly those that come from diverse backgrounds, have a particular interest in perhaps contributing back to their own community. So I'm interested in the way in which, first of all, we as educators in higher education can nurture and mentor those students to be social and ethical uh, citizens and graduates number one, and, and number two, what role does technology play in helping to enhance that learning experience for our students? Now, we've seen the kind of rhetoric about, you know, the net gen, the gen Y, I've heard it all, millenniums, um, I like the hot last one, Veens, homo zapiens, you know, whatever, you know, and I don't subscribe to labels, you'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, and, you know, so I guess what I would say, and I know, uh, you know, I'm talking to, to the, I'm preaching to the converted because I know you all understand that while there may be some characteristics in some of our students that might resonate, the reality is that we have a very, very diverse student population. Um, and we know that we all know from those of us that use technology, that technology is not a panacea, that, you know, we just can't provide a technology version of what we've been doing for decades that hasn't worked and assume it's going to work. Um, we also know that as new and emerging technologies, as we've mentioned, are very exciting and they do afford new opportunities for us to engage our learners. Um, leveraging the benefits of these technologies is, is quite complex and it, it, it does involve more than providing students with just physical access as we know. It's much deeper than that and I'll be touching on some of those things in the presentation. Similarly, we're starting to see increasing use of social media and how can we use social media effectively in education. But we shouldn't assume that that's a straightforward transition or that all of our students are necessarily engaged or want to use social media. So that's another factor to consider. And there are many challenges that we face in ensuring that these technologies are used in ways that maximise their inherent characteristics, their features that make them a useful technology for teaching and learning, but also in ways that are not going to be exclusionary to certain categories of students. For example, students who live in remote rural uh, communities, uh, locations and don't have access to high speed bandwidth, that's an obvious consideration. They may not have the up to date access to technology or access to technology at all for that matter. Um, they may have a particular disability, which means that if we're going to provide video, for example, um, that may be a challenge for them if, it, if, it, if it's not um, associated with prop, uh, appropriate auditory accompanying information or text that's read aloud. Uh, similarly, we've got deaf students. We're going to have to provide um, closed captioning for those students. 
And by and large, across the world, while universities recognise the importance of inclusive design to accommodate those students, most of us, including my own, we're grappling with it, but we're not yet doing it well. Okay? So there are many challenges to address. Um, and this is one of my very favourite quotes from Will Gibson back to 1999, who suggested that the future has arrived. We know that we have many of the available te technologies at our disposal, but we do also know that, and certainly in this context, that it's most certainly not evenly distributed. And it's not evenly distributed in a number of ways. As I said, it's not just about physical access, it's about the um, ability for students to use the technology as well. So we can't really talk about designing inclusive technology enhanced learning unless we define what we mean by inclusive education. A sort of uh, a fairly typical definition of inclusive education is this one here by Gard, which is the right of each student to receive accessible education within the mainstream regardless of their disabilities, abilities, race, gender or nationality. I would suggest that that's still a limited view of what really embraces inclusive education and I'll, I'll elaborate the, on that in, um, in future sections. All right, so we know it's also a, a, um, a high priority agenda um, in many policies. We know, for example, that the UN Millennium Development Goals are uh, largely in, embraced with this notion of accessible education. That also has informed UNESCO's work, you know, with education <coughs> for all. We've also got United Nations conventions that are relevant here, including the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which again talks about the importance of access to education and to information. So here from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 24 talks about the right of persons with disabilities to education um, without discrimination and on the basis of equal opportunity. All right? Talks about lifelong learning as well, which we know is very important. In, in our area of higher education. And Article 9 of that convention talks about those environments being physically accessible. <coughs> and notice the last point, so physical access means the buildings, the physical environment, but it also means point two, information, communication and other services. So that also includes all of our technology enhanced learning environments. You think about the implications for trying to make those technologies accessible to such a diverse student population. <coughs> now, I want to also step back just a little bit and challenge the discourse of the word inclusive as well. What do we really mean when we talk about social inclusion or education for all? Armstrong, Spandigo and, uh, um, and Armstrong in 2008 talked about that as these policies as being developed by first world states and they go on to challenge that discourse um, because in their view really the way in which includes inclusive principles of inclusive education have been rolled out and implemented in many countries has been more related to managing students in the classroom, managing challenges, managing difficulties um, and regulating for failure within our education systems rather than really engaging what we, what we mean when we talk about diverse students. So Alan ticks up on that point and talks about all of the numerous theories that have emerged out of the discussion about inclusive education. But the key point that Alan raises, which is the one I really want to pick up on, is a failure of many of us to apply those constructs, in other words, apply theory to practice through refashioning of our pedagogical approaches to teaching and learning. Therein lies the nub of the problem. The technology in itself is never going to be a panacea. We've recognised that from a long time. What we haven't done well across the board is refashioned our pedagogical approaches to teaching and learning in ways that embrace with diversity. So 
going on with that point, again, this move towards inclusion, a focus on the kind of the things that may seem easier to manage about inclusive education, access, equity through policy. In some ways, Alan argues, it's just re-territorialized difference leading to a focus on management rather than really getting down to the fact that we need to be engaging with the diversity of our students and challenging our students to understand diversity better themselves, to be change agents of the future. That's where my interest lies in engaging with this idea of inclusive education. All right, so I've, I've sort of laid out and sketched the landscape. I've challenged some of the existing notions of what we talk about when we talk about inclusive education. Now, don't, I can't really leave it dangling there without giving you some signposts to ways in which I think, and I have myself through various projects, tried to grapple with some of these challenges. So I guess I see there's kind of three key areas that we can really focus on to start to make a difference in this space. First of all, and underpinning all of that, is this need to challenge assumptions constantly. Okay? We're all academics. We're trained to debate, to, uh, to, to engage in this kind of challenging of assumptions and to look at new ways to move beyond the limitations of existing models and practices. All right, so I would argue that yes, we still need to look at the physical access. Do our students have access to the technology wherever they are, whatever technology they're using, whoever they are? So we do need to engage with that notion of accessibility. But that's only one picture, one piece of that big puzzle. We also need to engage with ways in which we change our pedagogical approach to teaching and learning so that it does embrace diversity and challenges our students to be social and ethical citizens. And I would argue that one of the best ways to do that is our engagement with community. Right? So, and I would argue underpinning all of that is the need for the scholarship of discovery. It needs an evidence base. It needs us as academics to be engaging in our own research into the scholarship of teaching and learning and researching our own practices that can inform policy direction and contribute to our understanding of what makes for effective teaching and learning and more specifically in this case technology enhanced learning. Um, so we need to engage with the scholarship of discovery. I'm drawing on Boyer's um, language here. The second pillar is, of course, the scholarship of teaching and learning and sharing and in, um, activities like this, events like this are an ideal opportunity. Internal teaching and learning grants are an ideal opportunity to share in that community of practice as scholars of teaching and learning and yet the other pillar of education, again drawing on Boyer's work, is the scholarship of engagement. Community engagement is a very effective way of drawing those three strands together because through community engagement our students become, they're mentored by us through research, through working with communities and applying in practice the theory that we introduce to them in the classroom. Right, so let's just look at some of these uh, issues. All right, I talked about the need for our, all of our practices, practices to be evidence-based. All right, that's the scholarship of discovery. So one of the first things that I have done in trying to engage with this idea of what do we need to make our environments more inclusive is I've drawn on the work of other surveys that have been conducted to try to get a better understanding of what our first year learners in, in Australian universities at least, what experience have they had with digital technologies when they come into the university? What are their expectations about the, how they'll be introduced and use technology to enhance their learning? So drawing on the work of Kennedy et al um, from University of Melbourne, we, we, we did our own study of our own students we um, sent out a survey to all our students, undergraduate and postgraduate, across all disciplines, all schools, all faculties, 
and we, we only had a, a relatively small um, response rate, but nevertheless a significant number of responses in total. We had 812. Um, of those, 77% were students who were born after 1980, so would be you know, the net gen categorization, if you like. Um, and, you know, just under half of them were in their first year of study, which was important because we're very much concerned about how we engage our first years to reduce it, attrition and so on. Um, and we had 20, nearly 22% of them of non-English speaking background. We had 13% who identified as international students studying in, in Australia. And there were a small percentage, and I talked to this Viv about this, you know, it's, it's a vastly different context in Australia than here. And it's something I'm not, I'm, I'm ashamed of, that such a small percentage of, and this would be, this is not dissimilar in many of the Australian universities, not so much in perhaps the Northern Territory, in the Northern, the Queen, Queensland universities, far North Queensland, but certainly in the mainstream, you know, we have such a small population of students. Now, not all of them would necessarily identify, of course, so we know that's perhaps an underestimate, but you've only got to work, walk through our campuses to see what kind of representation we have from our own Indigenous students. And we had um, nearly 0.5% uh, of students, again, a small number, but students with disabilities. So what our findings indicated that far from what the rhetoric said about, you know, this homogeneous net gen population already wired and ready to use technology, there was enormous diversity amongst our students. Moreover, while there were generational effects, i.e. the younger students were more likely to have used digital technology than the older students, it wasn't a clearly defined generation effect as such, as much as looking at the differences within the cohorts of the different age groups. And so what we found was certain patterns that emerged. For example, students who reported they have a disability and those students who were studying part-time and, and working, and we know that's a very large number of our students, were the least likely to be using technologies to enhance their, their social life and to enhance their teaching and learning. Now you think about the implications when we talk about students with disabilities. Technology's long been touted as the great leveller for students with a disability because you know you can have screen readers and you can magnify the screen and you can have alternative output and yet the very students who should be benefiting are the ones we're not somehow reaching. There's a problem there. So evidence does help to our approach. The other form of evidence that I engage with as some of you would know from those that have attended my sessions, my workshops and seminars previously about virtual worlds is um, we've also got a large number of universities across the world, and certainly in Australia, very strong representation, who are using 3D simulated learning environments to engage their learners in new and innovative ways. But we're also very concerned that these are very media-rich environments, very exciting, very engaging. But on the other hand, they're by their nature, they're very visual, which means people with vision impairment may struggle um, the user interface has a steep learning curve, so students with cognitive difficulties may find difficulties. And most of all, it's uh, high bandwidth, high end quality <coughs> machines. So an awful lot of students that don't have access to that level of technology. So I did an ethnographic study with people who identified as having disabilities to get a sense of how they were using these kinds of virtual environments. So again, some of the things that we, we came up with were these sorts of challenges. Interestingly, these accessibility challenges are not unique to any particular technology. They apply to most of our online technologies. You look at them. Lack of alternative text for images. When we put our course material on the website, if we don't put alternative text next to every image, a blind student is just going to hear if they use a screen reader, image one, image two, image three. Not very helpful. If the screen reader reads aloud um, picture of group of students engaging 
in, a, in a university classroom, that might be more useful than image, right? So, you know, to put alternative text against an image is incredibly easy. Most of our learning management systems now, content management systems, actually do provide a means to do it. But unless we as authors actually use the facility and have been shown how to use the facility, it's not going to be accessible. Keyboard accessibility limitations. Many, many of the websites that you go to, the only way to access those drop-down menus is a mouse. If you can't use a mouse, or, and I've been in the situation where I don't have access to a mouse on a particular occasion, try doing it via keyboard alone. There are some websites and some course sites where you literally can never get to the sub-menus if you don't have a mouse. Now, people with, who have disabilities need switching devices, alternative switches, all sorts of things that are not a traditional mouse. So they're immediately precluded just by that oversight. Capture systems, ever tried doing it? You know what I mean by capture? You go to sign up to a site and it's got the scrambled letters. How many of you have an accessibility challenge and try to get them right? You know, uh, refresh, 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 refresh. And if you've ever tried to listen to the accessible audio version, scramble, scramble, scramble. <laughs> so, you know, we know the capture system is in inherently inaccessible. There are ways of getting around it. Having a random number problem, like one plus two equals. Okay, yes, there may be some people that would struggle with that. I, granted, but it's a, or another one that we've used in some of our websites is having randomized sequence of numbers and asking what the first three letters or the first three characters are. So there are ways of making these things more accessible. I've talked about the need for captions and audio descriptions. That's not just about disability. How many of you are going to sit through a whole webcast? How many would? You know, an hour webinar? Probably not many. You might if you like to have, you know, your, your, um, uh, if you like to, to listen to podcasts while you're out walking the dog or something. Uh, you can't really see the visuals though, you can only listen. Uh, you might if you, if you bus it to, to, to work every day. But you might not be an auditory type person or a visual person. You might like to read. You might like to skim read. But if you're a student of non-English speaking background, you might like the captions as well as the audio as well as the visuals. So these sorts of features are about accommodating diversity. They're not about any specific necessarily population. Things like fixed font size. Hmm. Browsers these days allow you to expand the size of the font, but if people have created the website in such a way that it's fixed, and I want you to look at eight point regardless of whether your eyes can manage eight point, again, little considerations make a huge difference to our different sorts of students. Um, and increasingly, this, um, this second to last point, user generated content, I talked about content management systems, you know, that's the sort of WordPress, for example, where you can go in and you can create your blog. You don't need to be a web designer to create your own blog. We're using these kinds of dynamic user-generated authoring systems quite a lot now. And many of them do provide facilities to make the, what we produce as a, a novice more accessible. But most of us wouldn't know how to use those features. So we need to engage with accessibility. One way we can do that is through the notion of inclusive design. And what inclusive design is all about is um, it's based on the principles of universal design. Have you heard of universal design? It's the idea that you don't develop products or services for only a small cohort of people, but you design in a way that's going to benefit the most people. Right? Uh, there are criticisms of universal design. One of the criticisms being, well, you'll never accommodate absolutely every individual need. And I would say that we've actually moved a long way from universal design now when we start to talk about the exciting developments with the emerging technologies around personalised learning environments. That is, technology-enhanced learning that is responsive. It says this student has managed modules one, three, five really well, but not managed module two so well, 
So let's encourage them to go back and do some more work. You know, those intelligence-driven systems which intuitively can pull together information. But we can be our own personalised learning environments by using, again, the evidence base. We've got now, through our learning management systems, access to things like learning analytics. That will tell us how many modules the students have engaged in, how often they've engaged with a particular module. Did they ever look at those podcasts that we put up? How long did they stay on those podcasts? Did they ever even look at the assessment criteria? We know all of that. Our database systems that sit behind learning management systems, the, the Moodles, the Sakai's, all of those systems now have learning analytics. And we academics can access that information. If we do and we harvest that evidence, we can the learning experience, even if we don't have access to the high end uh, intelligent systems that are automatically responsive. And I use learning analytics when I'm tr working with my classes. If, if I have an external group of students, the first thing I will do is look at the analytic data that I can get out of the system each week at the end of the week and I will say, okay, how many completed the first prac? How many read the first module? How many have, learnt, have, have read about what the assessment criteria are, what the graduate attributes um, that we aim to focus on in this course are? And if I see you know, external students who haven't even logged in to the Moodle system, we have a problem. <laughs> they're external. They're never coming onto campus. If they're not engaging there, they're not engaging full stop. Okay? So you need to use that evidence to help inform your practices. Then you can use other technologies to connect with them. They don't read their email. Right? They're not looking at their learning management system to see the posting to the discussion forum. Most of them got mobile phones. I'll text them. Okay? I know you're there. And you don't do it in a way that's like surveillance. It's about, I actually care. You're one of my students and you don't seem to be engaging. Is there a problem here? How can I help you? And what the, the response I would typically get back from weeks one to three when I do that 90% of the students will come back to me and, and respond. And what do I often find out? I couldn't find how to log in. I didn't know even what my password was. I have, I'm terrified of technology, okay? Most of the reasons were not the reasons we might have assumed in the absence of that extra layer of care. It's you know, what we would call pastoral care. We would do it on the classroom, in the classroom situation. We should be doing it in a flexible learning environment online as well. All right, so that's what I see as inclusive design. It's much more than accommodating the, the lowest common denominator. Yes, it's good to design in a way that accommodates as many different kinds of students as we can imagine. But the layer that is absolutely critical is personalising the learning experience. Yes, technology is moving in that direction, but we we can be agents of that in the absence of high tech solutions, and we should be engaging with that. So you'll see a lot of the practices around <coughs> inclusive design focus on you know that 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 layer that I talked about is just being about the physical access. They don't get down to our teaching and learning practices that make environments more inclusive. Do you see the difference? One thing about making technology available, affordable, accessible in different formats, it's another for us to engage with our learners in a way that personalises the learning environment for them. And we don't need the high-tech solutions to do that. So yes, I do engage with high-tech solutions. Those of you that have been to my, um, my other presentations on 3D virtual worlds will know about this particular Australian Learning and Teaching Council funded project, which was to try to make those high-end, high-rich media virtual learning simulations more accessible to students with disabilities. And I'm not gonna dwell on that because it's one of many projects and many of you have heard about that. I, I do want to now move on quickly to pedagogy because I, I emphasise that that is one of the more important areas of our focus. 
And in order to challenge our existing teaching and learning practices in a way that makes maximal use of our technology enhanced learning, we need to understand what the individual affordances are of the technologies that we are using. And you might say, well, what do I mean by the term affordance? It's typically been designed, defined by designers as the perceived and actual properties of a technology or of, of, a, of a product that determine how that product will be used. In the context of technology enhanced learning, we would say it's the products, it's the properties of our TEL, -E -E our enhanced educational learning technologies that determine its unique characteristics and how we use it. I guess the most tangible example I could give you is in a, in a, in a situation like a 3D virtual world, which is very media rich and so on, it has all sorts of specific affordances. But if you just transfer your tutorial from the classroom into little avatars that are sitting in a virtual world, that's not using the affordances of that environment at all effectively. Why? All you've done is moved a personalised experience to a mediated experience, not used any of the benefits, not even challenged yourself as to why am I doing this? And yet you look at any number of examples of how these environments are being used and it's just that. We've got a group of students sitting here today instead of in the classroom. And I guess one of the, the, the classic uh, examples of, a, of how a student related to that with, with me was um, on one occasion I met with one of my students in the virtual world who represented himself as an avatar came up to me and he sat down and he said, oh, this is so cool. I'm uh, in text chat, of course. Uh, I, here am I talking to my professor. And I said, yeah, but I have an office down the corridor. You know, so, you know, we, we really need to challenge what we mean when we talk about the characteristics, the features of these environments that um, maximise their affordances. Similarly, we're starting to use, as I said, Web 2.0. You know, many of our learning management systems incorporate now, don't they, Web 2.0 technology, such as blogs, such as wikis, such as video functionality, and so on. Um, and so there are certain features about wikis and blogs, video sharing, and, and so forth, that have particular characteristics that can engage our learners in what Bruns 2008 talks about the Generation C capacities. That's a, a play on, of course, the Generation Y. Generation C, that is the capacity to be creative, collaborative, critical, combinatory, and communicative. Okay, so that's what Bruns would classify as some of the affordances that Web2 offers. But how many uh, academics are using blogs in a way that engages with those features of Web 2.0. Um, now, I, again, because of time, I won't go, and I have talked about this case study in other fora, so I just briefly overview one example from my own course, a first year course, there, there's an introduction to the use of digital media. So what students do, they use a Moodle learning management system, it has all those Web 2 functions in it. The way in which I've embedded the Web2 is for that students use the blog as a reflective journal. It's a way for them to reflect on practice-based research that they do for their first assignment, which informs the development of an artifact. In this case, the artifact is a digital story that they create for a community organisation. So I try to get my first years on the ground working with community organisations and with media. They create a website for that organisation with their embedded digital story as part of their assignments. And then right at the end, we, um, we affirm their, um, their, their work by showcasing, with communities invited, they showcase their productions. And we use, um, this, uh, we use uh, Votopedia, which is just a mobile phone way of them voting for their viewers' choice. So we have a, a big industry engagement um, exercise at the end. So I'll just flip through those. Um, uh, just very quickly, you can see the difference when I redesigned that course. The blue was the traditional course that we took before we incorporated Web 2 and, and used some of those affordances. And the red is where we ended up 
um, down the track after we re-evaluated the course. So on all criteria, I won't go into detail, but we were trying to get them to engage with research through design. You can see the difference. Enjoyed the challenging challenge of doing their own project, and they saw research as good, which is something we wanted to engage them with first year, rather than just learning about technology, we wanted them to engage in a research practice approach. I'm going to flick through all of these because we've, I've talked so many times, um, so just excuse me because time's against us, and I talked about that very classic example. Here's just some of the screenshots taken from our different uses of virtual worlds which are trying to maximise the affordances of that technology. So I just want to focus on this one because this is one of my final year courses where students use the virtual world to connect with community organisations to do a service learning project. Um, so that was an interesting use of the virtual world. They were working here, this group of um, students were with a global audience of clients who were from disability organisations. And this was one of the debriefing sessions where they were talking about some of the challenges they had working with these disability organisations in a global environment. So that was more effective use of 3D virtual worlds. And finally, moving on to that th third strand, I've alluded to service learning and the importance of service learning. Um, I believe service learning is an incredibly effective strategy for integrating those scholarships that I talked to you before about. Here we have that point that I raised at the outset about the scholarship and engagement. It does draw on Boyer's applications of scholarship of discovery, that is research-led practice, um, the scholarship, scholarship of teaching and learning, and the scholarship of engagement, the three pillars, traditional pillars of what university ought to be about. And just quickly, um, we have a third year initiative which has been, it's been going now for 11 years, so it's been a very successful initiative. It's a partnership with the South Australian Government's Office for Volunteers. These students, again, are web design students um, doing this particular course, Electronic Publishing on the Internet, where they basically are working on a proposal for a website for an organisation. They develop the website designer and then the final website, which is hosted by our university. Some of the challenges in service learning, or some of the benefits, I should say, are gains in student self-esteem, their ability to apply theory to practice, so enhancing career knowledge, social responsibility, uh, level of student insight, applying academic skills, and so on, and obviously the community benefits as well. Challenges. Obviously, once they start to work with real-world organisations, conflicting aims and timelines, obviously it's more work for academics um, and for working with the community has its challenges. Um, the rela relationship in service learning ought to be reciprocal, right? The students get something out of it and so too do the organisations. And if it's a one-way bias, then you're not achieving those goals. And sometimes milestones are not met and so on. Some of the initiatives you can see here are where we bring the students together with their community organisations. We use technology underpinning that to, i um, not going to go into detail of the findings, but we, we use technology to enhance communication between the community organisations. Technology also underpins the fact that the students are teaching many of their volunteer organisations about how to use technology as well. So it's a true win-win situation for students and for communities. And so those three strands, making our environments more accessible, personalising the learning experience in that process, challenging existing discourses in order to inform pedagogical change and practices, and engaging with the community in innovative ways, I think, is one way forward towards a more inclusive approach. So, that leads me just to summarise by saying our new um, research project that's just been funded by the Office for Learning and Teaching, of which Viv is, and this university is involved, is an evidence-based approach to the design and redevelopment of inclusive technology-enhanced learning environments. Our aims in this project, which has literally just been awarded, so we're about to kick it off, that we've got our first meeting while I'm here at UWC, 
is to demonstrate the benefits of using that kind of evidence base. And I alluded to some of the evidence, you know, it's about surveying our students. It's about using, harvesting the learning analytic data so we know how our students are using the environment. It's about looking at how usable and accessible our environments are. It's about rich, thick data where we, we have focus groups, qualitative data from our students and from our teachers. Then what we're doing is redesigning the courses informed by the evidence and trialling them again with different cohorts of students in order to come up with these guidelines for academics on the design and redevelopment of inclusive technology enhanced learning curricula. The other interesting thing I talked about, personalised technology that's moving to personalising the learning experience, we're actually going to trial one such system in conjunction with an open source organisation. And that's the final strand, I guess, that we need to all be thinking about, is open source. You know that's the movement, open education. It is a way of making more content, more material available to you as an academic and also to your students. But in this case, what we're doing is engaging with the open source community to say, help us to better develop our technologies. And they'll do that for free. And what is good about that is it's bringing them into helping to inform the future of technology. And it gives us a more sustainable path to any innovation that we develop. Because if you go the open source route, they will pick it up and follow it and carry it through. And so just to, to finalise that, um, because we don't have time, I can't show you the video. Um, but it's building on a global public inclusive infrastructure which very quickly conceptually means the student logs into their, with their login, they have a profile that says, look, you know, I need, I like my learning materials delivered in this, this or this way. If they're a student with a disability, I need high contrast screen display or I need a screen reader. It works out what technology they're using to log in. If they have a disability, it will invoke the built-in accessibility feature. So if it's an iPhone, it will say, oh, you've got an iPhone and you're blind. Okay, we can get the, we can get the screen reader to read aloud to you. So we're trying to work with this um, organisation that's already doing this groundbreaking work in order to integrate it into learning management systems. And so we will be trialling that as, as part of the project. Okay, so in conclusion, let's just go back to that favourite quote of mine, right. reflecting back on Will Gibson's um, claim, sorry, it's a little bit small, that the future has arrived but it's not evenly distributed. Um, I guess what I've tried to paint to you is, yes, that is a, still a reality. Um, we know that the, there is greater diversity in our student population than language, the, the rhetoric of Gen Y would suggest. We know that there are particular groups of students, those in remote locations, those with disabilities who have particular difficulties with using technology enhanced learning. We know now that inclusive education is not just about physical access, it's also about pedagogical approaches and engaging our students in being ethical citizens and understanding and valuing diversity. So it's about challenging our assumptions about diversity. And a holistic approach, I would argue, brings together the three scholarships of scholarship of discovery, the scholarship of teaching and learning, and the scholarship of engagement. And technology can underpin and support that. It will never be a panacea, but it is a way, hence the new language, rather than e-learning, technology enhanced learning. The focus is on the learning. Technology, in used appropriately, can enhance the learning. Thank you. Thanks very much for that whirlwind. Um, I think there was much more in that presentation that you could have gone on and told us about. Um, we have, it's actually 9.57 now, and we're due for the next presentation at 10. But I was wondering if people wanted to take 10 minutes out of the tea time um, to ask Denise any questions, um, which we could do while we're setting up the next mm. presentation. Can we take a couple of minutes then? Because I think it would be a pity um, not to do that since you're not with us all the time. So um, are there any questions for Denise or comments?
or anything you'd like to elaborate on. <laughs> no questions? Who's engaging with inclusive learning practices? Have we got some examples? You are all innovative teaching and learning people, I believe. You've all been funded for different sorts of projects, some of which are probably technology based. So how are you engaging with the diversity of your students if indeed you are using different kinds of technologies in your teaching and learning? I'm sure there's some great innovators amongst you, but you're shy. <laughs> Do you have diversity in your classes? <laughs> Do you have challenges in meeting diversity in your classes? Um, I have a question. Yes. I've got um, a new I've tried to set up my class with um, the notes up on the internet and the world sheets up. And you see them with the books of the link. And there's a part of the internet that they can ask questions. Mm -hmm. Is there any uncertainty about the teachers or what you do know about the questions? I found that this um, probably just for the first semester about five questions mm -hmm. that the people ask. So is use of a discussion forum just for asking and answering questions about assignments or course material, the best use of a discussion forum and is it likely to get the maximal participation do you think? Can anyone think of other ways that you get to students to engage with discussion forum activities? Okay, well that is one of the big challenges of course, right? In fact, you know, how many of you engage in peer review where you actually get a colleague to come in and either look at your online course, sit in on an online course, or sit in on your class and give you feedback? How many of you do that? How many could be doing it? Okay, I do. And the feedback I get from my colleagues is immensely valuable. I know a lot of academics find that quite threatening. But it doesn't have to be. It can be a way of formatively helping to develop. So fairly early on in one of my courses, you know, I was concerned about some of these issues. So I just asked some of my colleagues, you know, some of the colleagues who I knew were innovative and good teachers and had interesting approaches. Do you just, just come and have a look at, you know, the dialogue in my discussion forum? Just give me some feedback. And one of the first things, one of the first comments was, well, there's a, in, in my case, there was actually a lot of engagement. But she said, Denise, it's really superficial stuff. It's like, you know, when's assignment one due? Or how many words do I need for assignment? And she said, that's not really, you know, that's not really engaging with your students effectively. And I said, no, you're right, actually. What <coughs> could I do better? Well, drawing back on that first year case study where I talked about, you know, how I'd redesigned it and everything, that's the very course where I also redesigned the way in which I was using things like blogs and discussion forums, right? So rather than see them, yes, I still offered a little discussion forum, which was labelled as such, you know, for students to, you know, frequently ask questions type forum. But that was not the focus, you know. I had the other forum, which was where they <coughs> wanted them to really engage with each other. And so to give you a lovely example of what was sort of, you know, you facilitate your students to drive the agenda, okay, rather than you taking leadership. So a very good example of where that worked well was that first year course where I had my students um, working either with a community organisation or identifying a social issue they wanted to promote through their digital story. As I said, their first assignment about practice-based research, researching the social issue or the sorts of services the organisation offers uh, via their blog, reflecting on that, getting collaboration going, you know, if you're going to come up with ideas, that's what creative problem solving requires, brainstorming and all that. So I got them using creative problem solving approach in their, in their discussion forum. You know, how could you brainstorm with your friends and get some ideas about how you might go about this project? And some of the students took that and ran with it. So the best example I can re 
vividly recall, was a student who um, was going to do the subject of um, the um, factory farming, right? The situation, you know, the pigs in little styes and, you know, the poultry in these tiny little cages and all the rest of it. But through creative problem solving, rather than just do the stereotypical digital story that I'd seen a million times, which is all the horrible pictures and then the happy pictures of the animals out in the pasture and how life could be so rosy if only we liberated our animals. But rather than that, through challenging assumptions, thinking creatively, she came up with the idea of challenging discourse about the... Um, Western versus other countries' view of animal rights and animal welfare. So she turned it around to a much deeper set of issues about our value judgments. And so she had a dialogue between animals in her digital story, which was one animal saying, isn't it disgusting about the ways in which in Japan they're you know, they kill all the whales and how, you know, they, they, they eat dogs in, you know, China. When you went to her blog, she'd strategically put a picture of dogs being collected in a tiny little cage on the back of a, you know, a bike about to be slaughtered, right, and eaten. And, you know, and, and of course, Western students go, oh my God, oh, that is so cruel, that is just horrible. And then you scroll down and there's the pig in the sty and the caption, can you see Different. Well, the discussion that arose was far more about than animal welfare and animal rights. It's about you know our views about the different cultural views about how we value animals or don't value animals. What is ethical? It was so rich. Well, guess what? It started a trend. The next post was, "Would you have an abortion?" <laughs> so. I guess what I'm saying is you need to think of discussion forums as an opportunity to engage your learners at that level rather than thinking of it, yes, give them space to do that if they need space for FAQs or whatever, but rather think about the ways in which you can get students to take ownership and leadership and see it as an opportunity for them to engage with their peers. You don't need to drive that heavily, but you need to facilitate it to encourage that. So I guess that's, that would be my immediate reaction to getting engagement at the discussion forum, try to facilitate, um, not direct what's going to happen on the discussion forum. Thanks, Denise.